While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators, and left the children to die on the cold floor. You just watched a portion of gut-wrenching testimony from the early 90s from a 15-year-old Kuwaiti girl who claims that she witnessed Iraqi soldiers actually remove babies from incubators and left them on the floor to die. That testimony really spoke to the barbarity of Saddam Hussein's regime, and that testimony was used to manufacture consent for then-President George H.W. Bush's Gulf War. The problem, however, is that it was a hoax, and she was lying. Nayira's testimony was rebroadcast across the country and marked a turning point in public opinion on going to war. President George H.W. Bush repeatedly cited her claims. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. Three months after Nayira testified, President George H.W. Bush launched the invasion of Iraq. But it turned out Nayira's claims weren't true. No human rights group or news outlet could confirm what she said. It also turned out Nayira was not just any Kuwaiti teenager. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States, Saad Nasir al-Sabah. She had been coached by the public relations firm Hill & Knowlton, which was working for the Kuwaiti government. Now, in a 1992 write-up about that lie in The New York Times, John MacArthur explained, Amnesty International believed the tale and its ill-considered validation of the charges likely influenced the seven U.S. senators who cited the Saurian speeches supporting the January 12th resolution authorizing war. Now, the reason why we're talking about this is because the thought of babies being taken out of incubators to be left to die was so appalling to politicians, rightfully so, that they felt compelled to take action immediately. But fast forward to today, and babies are actually being taken out of incubators. And this time, it's because there's no electricity to maintain the incubators. And the difference now, compared to the 90s, is that politicians don't feel compelled to take action. Most still refuse to call for a ceasefire despite being fully aware that they are effectively complicit with this. The ground operations are right at the gates of Al-Shifa Hospital right now. Hospital officials are saying there is fighting literally in the blocks surrounding the hospital. Shifa at this point is completely surrounded uh, by Israeli forces, Israeli tanks, and there are Israeli drones overhead that anybody who tries to step outside uh, the buildings, there are several buildings that make up the complex that is the Shifa hospital, anybody stepping on outside uh, comes under fire. Now, there are 20,000 people uh, taking refuge in the hospital itself, in addition to the 400 patients that doctors are treating. The World Health Organization is now saying Al-Shifa Hospital, the largest, most important medical facility in the Gaza Strip, is effectively no longer functional. There is no running water. There is no electricity. There is the bare minimum of medical operations going on at this point. There are some 600 patients inside the hospital, Andrea, but no case is more urgent than the dozens of prematurely born babies who were being held in the neonatal unit there. The electricity is gone. Those newborns, some of them younger than this war itself, have been taken out of their incubators. They were, last we heard, being held in the surgery unit at Al-Shifa Hospital. Dozens of tiny, tiny Gazans on two beds being kept together, swaddled to try to keep them warm. In some cases, medical officials respirating them with their hands, trying to keep them breathing, basically doing everything they can to keep them alive. Hospital officials tell us at least three of these newborns have died so far. And I spoke earlier to Dr. Shireen Abed. She is the former head of neonatal care at Al-Shifa Hospital. She says she has no doubt in her mind that more of them are going to die if there is not a solution found urgently. And in addition to that, there are dozens of bodies of people have, who have been killed that are essentially piled up outside the hospital, but they can't be buried because of the fighting that's going on around it. 
And Andrea, this is a scenario we are seeing playing out all across the Gaza Strip right now. The key humanitarian facilities are running out of their last drops of fuel. UNRWA, the United Nations, says they are going to have to close their humanitarian operations in the next 48 hours if they do not get more fuel in. It is genuinely difficult to watch. Now, I stitched together reporting from CNN and MSNBC because they both provide us with different details that paint the same bleak picture. And I didn't want it to be too redundant by showing you two different clips, but that's what you saw. Now, if the mere testimony of babies being pulled from incubators in the 90s galvanized action by U.S. lawmakers, you would think that actually seeing pictures of babies would do the same thing. I mean, they're real. We can see them. And doctors themselves from Al-Shifa Hospital have explained that the situation is a catastrophe. And as the fighting takes place, they are forced to stay because if they leave, that means they're abandoning their patients. They're leaving these babies to die. So that means they're sitting ducks. They could be bombed next. So let's listen to the doctors and what they have to say. On the fourth floor, and also there's a sniper to attack four patients from the inside the hospital. One of them has the gunshot directly in his neck, and he has a quadriplegia, and the other one, he has a gunshot in the abdomen. Some of the people which actually go outside the hospital, they want to go to the south, they bump them also, they bump the family. We can see actually the smoking, uh, the smoke around the hospital. They hit everything around the hospital, and they hit the hospital many times. Situation, as I said before, very, very bad. Why don't you go with your family south? And, and if I go, who treats my patients? We are not animals. We have the right to receive proper health care. You think I went to medical school and for my postgraduate degrees for a total of 14 years. So I think only about my life and not my patients. I'm asking you, ma'am, do you think this is the reason why I went to med school? To think only about my life. This is so, not the reason why I became a doctor. Now, unfortunately, that was the very last interview from Dr. Hamam Alo before he was killed in his home with his father by an IDF airstrike. And quote, his mother, who is also a doctor, Dr. Haifa Al-Saraj, is trapped with other relatives, including children, in the vicinity of the house. They are unable to move, and any attempt to move comes under heavy Israeli fire. One relative is also currently alive and trapped under rubble. They have been in touch with the Red Cross, who are unable to evacuate them. The Israeli Defense Forces need to cease fire in the Abu Hasira neighborhood so they can be safely evacuated. This devastation is incomprehensible. And the Al-Shifa hospital is not the only hospital that is getting bombed. Now, guess what Israel's excuse is? Well, Hamas, they're at the hospital. They're using these patients as human shields. It doesn't fucking matter. You don't get to bomb hospitals ever. And it's not just patients who are at risk there. There are people in shelter at these hospitals. So it, this is one of those situations where the destruction is so catastrophic that it's almost difficult to fathom. Like, it's hard to even picture it as you see it. Like, I kind of just go numb. That's how bad it is. And I'm sure you all feel the same way. And Dr. Hamam Alo died a hero because he refused to abandon his patients. He could have evacuated to the south, although that's not a sure bet that he'd be safe, but he could have been with his family. But he said, I'm not going to abandon my patients. And he died in his home, by the way. And even though it is predictably what we all expected would happen, even though we all knew it would come to this, where doctors are being killed and babies are literally dying because the hospitals no longer have any electricity, American politicians still can't find it upon themselves to utter the words ceasefire. Now, President Biden was asked about this in particular, especially considering that the blood of those babies is on his hands as well. And his response was just awful, predictably, and pathetic, as you're going to see. And his body language really says it all. The hospital in Gaza, the hospital Kelly was in Gaza. In. Have you expressed any specific concerns to Israel on that, sir? Well, uh, you know, I uh, have not been reluctant in 
expressing my concerns that's going on. Um, and it's my hope and expectation that uh, there will be uh, less intrusive action relative to the hospital. Uh, we're in contact and we're with, uh, with the Israelis. Also, there is an effort to uh, uh, take this pause to deal with the release of prisoners. And that's being negotiated as well with the Qataris that are engaged. And uh, so I remain somewhat hopeful, but the hospital must be protected. Well, it's a little late for that, don't you think? Look, he knows what he's doing. You could see it in his body language. He's mumbling. His head is down. He's trying to find some way to express concern while avoiding the elephant in the room, which is he's complicit. That's his fault there, too. And the U.S. State Department won't officially acknowledge Israel's war crimes, despite them saying we're going to do collective punishment, despite ample evidence that they are using white phosphorus, the State Department is still officially saying that there's no evidence of war crimes. Although, there's a lot of heroes within the State Department who are brave enough to not toe the line and call out that bullshit. Axios reports, an internal State Department dissent memo accuses President Biden of spreading misinformation on the Israel-Hamas war and alleges that Israel is committing war crimes in Gaza, according to a copy of the memo obtained by Axios. The scathing five-page memo, organized by a junior diplomat who has suggested on social media that Biden's support of Israel has made him complicit in genocide in Gaza offers a rare look at the raw divisions within the Biden administration over the Israel-Hamas war. The memo, signed by 100 State Department and USAID employees, urges senior U.S. officials to reassess their policy toward Israel and demand a ceasefire in Gaza, where more than 11,000 Palestinians have been killed in the war, according to Gaza's Hamas-controlled health ministry. And by the way, of the 11,000 Palestinians killed so far, more than 4,100 of them have been children. Absolutely barbaric. And yet, politicians are still too afraid to call for a ceasefire. I mean, they are despicable. Now, this memo from the State Department comes almost a month after HuffPost initially reported that a mutiny was brewing within the State Department, specifically over the Biden administration's handling of this situation. And uh, I guess now it looks like the chickens are finally coming home to roost for Joe Biden. Now, due to massive public pressure, as well as a significant drop in the polls, well, Biden's administration has been forced to at least adjust course a little bit. So he's managed to work out a four hour pause per day of fighting and he's also feigned more concern over innocent palestinians but yet the administration recently reiterated that they're still not drawing any red lines for israel and a ceasefire is not on the table and that seemingly still hasn't changed even after learning about babies dying due to a lack of electricity and even when he was asked about the hospital if you'll notice, he did not condemn Israel. He says, yes, I want to protect the hospital, still won't condemn Israel, still won't call out their war crimes. And we're all going to give them more money? I mean, what is happening here? It's just our politicians are awful. And it's not just Biden. I mean, the pro-life Republicans who claim to care about life don't even pretend to care at all about dying babies in Gaza. And it's not just the far right, it's also the left. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, even though they're much better at performatively expressing sympathy than other politicians, I mean, they're not even calling for a ceasefire. In fact, most politicians are still telling us to go fuck ourselves when we ask for a ceasefire. John Fetterman, for example, aka Kirsten Sinema in a hoodie, was literally waving an Israeli flag to antagonize protesters calling for a ceasefire, and they were even arrested for civil disobedience, and that was him right there antagonizing them. What a piece of shit. And to be clear, there's no excuse for any politician. I don't care who you are. If you're on the left or the right, there's no excuse for any of you. Because it's not like you don't know what we want. They've seen the protests that we've all seen. They've looked at the same polls that we've looked at. And on top of that, they're feeling the heat because congressional staffers are overwhelmed with phone calls of people saying, please support a fucking ceasefire. What are you doing? HuffPost reports, 
Staffers from more than two dozen Democratic offices say they are receiving an unprecedented number of calls and emails demanding for members to support a ceasefire, an onslaught for which their caucus was wholly unprepared. Following the October 7th attacks on Israel by Hamas militants, up to three weeks passed and the death toll from Israel's retaliatory strikes reached the thousands before many offices even formulated an official response. Let it go to voicemail was the prevailing guidance in several offices, one staffer said. The yawning mismatch between voters and members sentiments on this issue strikes many staffers as outrageous. Quote, this building is not listening, said one Democratic aide. I've never seen such a disconnect between where voters and constituents are and where Congress is, and that's saying something because there's always a disconnect. So it's not like they can't hear us. They do. They're just choosing to ignore our calls for a ceasefire, which makes them all complicit, too, as far as I'm concerned. And every single politician who doesn't call for a ceasefire is a scumbag. But the one that still bugs me the most is got to be Bernie Sanders, right? He might not be as antagonistic as someone like John Fetterman, but I expect more from him. In fact, two years ago, he called for a ceasefire, but all of a sudden he refuses to do the same thing even though the situation is exponentially worse and he presumably isn't going to call for a ceasefire regardless of how bad the humanitarian disaster gets. And this is the same fucking guy who told all of us that we need a political revolution with thousands of Americans in the streets demanding recalcitrant politicians listen to us. And after tens of thousands of people have been in the streets every single weekend across the country, in cities across the world, after protesters literally occupied his fucking office demanding that he call for a ceasefire, he still won't do it. He's resisting the grassroots, ignoring our calls. It's just so frustrating. But in the end, this really isn't about any one politician, as frustrating as it may be to see them be either uh, just antagonistic towards us or ignore us. This is about our entire political system, and this moment should be a wake-up call for everyone. It's an indictment of our entire political system. Because if politicians won't do the bare minimum and call for a ceasefire like their constituents want after 4,100 children, including babies, have fucking died, that is not a democracy. That's not a democracy. So every politician refusing to call for a ceasefire shouldn't get a second of peace until they call for one. So keep calling them, keep protesting them. If you see them in public, politely confront them, keep the pressure up on Republicans, Democrats, even progressives like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, because if they're going to pretend to not hear us, we're not going to make it any easier for them to ignore us. Oh, man.